So our first keynote uh, will be Thomas Bednart. He's is director of visualization at the epicenter at UNSW, Art and Design. Um, he has a fantastic lab with many uh, hardware facilities dedicated to immersive analytics. I spent a few weeks uh, last uh, July in, in his lab. And um, he will uh, make um, a keynote about immersive analytics and digital twins and expanded perception. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, okay, we'll have to uh, try this. Magic button. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you so much, Terry, for uh, introduction, and thank you, VRSD, for inviting me. It was like very last minute, uh, but how I hope it will work and it won't be too boring. I think we're coming more from uh, Sydney side, so I wanted to, s uh, to say a few words about what we have in Sydney as well, in terms of like VR and VR labs. Uh, so that my talk will be focusing a bit on that as well, in a way. So my name is Tomasz Bednarz. For those who don't know me, I work, I have three jobs at the moment. Uh, I will have two jobs after next week, after SIGGRAPH Asia is over. Uh, so it will be much easier perhaps with time and so on. Uh, so I work as a director of Expanded Perception Interaction Center in, at UNSW Art and Design. I'm as well like leading team in visual analytics and CSI Data 61, which is our national uh, federal golf lab, uh, which, which is actually making Australia a better place. I as well uh, work as an individual member of the Kronos Group, so helping helping Kronos Group as well to advertise different standards, especially 3D, 3D models and computational uh, frameworks like OpenCL, for instance. And, and I have adjunct positions at UniSA and QUT, and I'm the conference chair of CIGLAC Asia uh, 20, 2019. So I start perhaps with Epicenter, just give you a bit of overview about that. Uh, this stuff will be like showing you lots of examples of different projects we do. I want to actually like drive a bit of discussions and and uh, make sure like you you know uh, have like more examples than than really like one focused topic, uh, which actually would make some people want to actually bought with just one topic. So just try to show lots of examples. So Epicenter is in almost in the city center, so it's in Paddington. Uh, it's a high performance visualization lab. Uh, we focus our research in visual analytics, high performance visualization, uh, connecting simulations and AI, so something like Thomas is as well in, in this field. Uh, human in the loop HCI research. Uh, we collaborate very closely with different labs in Australia and we're building like a networks of uh, kind of internet of big machines cross connecting across uh, the globe as well different labs that uh, have like different types of, you know, like systems. So introduce you uh, and a couple of slides as well around what kind of systems we have in Epicenter and what kind of visualization tools we, we do. But I wanted to say to start perhaps because it's a VR conference, start the power of immersive visualizations, how I hope it will start. Doesn't start. So what VR can do can actually put us inside the simulations and we can feel being really inside uh, the real situation. So this is showing like perfect example from TV, uh, how VR can change your perception on stuff, expand your perception in a way. So like showing this as an example, because that's exactly what we, would, what we do and perhaps all of us here in this room do with the data and VR. Okay, so that's the entry point. So Epicenter is at UNSW Art and Design, which is in Paddington, I mentioned that. I wanted to show you the building just in case if you want to come and visit. Uh, and I will say a few words about it as well at the very end of my presentation. It's in this white building, which is just in the very beautiful backyard. It's surrounded by uh, graffiti on the walls and a couple of like makers labs, VR labs, and so on. So it's like very, very central uh, in a way. And basically like, I will say a few words as well about how you can visit Epicenter if you, if you have time uh, during your stay in Sydney. And I wanted to start really like with, with, with myself, like when I was starting doing anything with graphics, was I was always saying, if you can draw a pixel, you can create anything you like, right? And we start always with, with 
something super, super simple. So I started with Commodore C64, and, and Commodore C64 was driving my computer graphics, you know, experience. And if you don't remember those computers, just please come to SIGGRAPH Asia because we're preparing for your like, big show. You can learn how to code machine, machine learning uh, skills on Commodore C64, play music, and draw the big pixels. Uh, so basically, uh, my, my uh, research is in uh, visualization mainly and visual analytics. That's why I'm talking about pixels. And, and pixels can give you like, the whole uh, tools for creating anything you can imagine. And if you talk about visual analytics, uh, so touching on human factors and as well, like uh, human in the loop, user interactions, we have some raw data coming in, we do some analytics, and visualization is helping us to modify the models to have better uh, decision uh, making processes uh, once, we, uh, once we have some proper setup and proper models uh, created as we go. So visualization is not necessary, but uh, it's necessary but not sufficient and the purpose of visualization is insight not the pictures so I'm just trying to say you know like uh, we're trying to make sure that we have the insights from the visualizations we are uh, showing and analyzing and the purpose of computing is insight but don't, not, not the numbers so uh, and you have to realize that everything connects to everything else so I will show you like lots of projects examples when you have visualization and compute connected together lots of simulations AI lots of virtual reality examples and a uh, bunch of other things as well along the way I don't need perhaps to explain this stroke plot which is very very traditional in this kind of setting so everybody knows new grounds uh, reality virtuality continuum and my presentations will show examples of different uh, types of visualization done across all the scales so starting from real environment and going into virtual environments throughout the augmented reality and augmented virtuality. So firing the image engine, so that's what we do in Epicenter, and I will show you examples of that in a second. So Epicenter is in one particular building, uh, which is like the old photography lab that was uh, refreshed, and we put lots of uh, visualization tools, so currently we have five different labs. And, and those labs, uh, they are very, very unique, in my opinion. And it's very, very unique settings because often labs have uh, like a small rooms and nothing is just one building. So this is a very unique setting. So particularly, we have like the system called EpiCylinder. So currently, the EpiCylinder is the highest resolution virtual reality system in the world. So we hosted uh, an epicenter in the building. Uh, it has uh, 340 degrees uh, cylindrical screens, so it's built of uh, 56 mm. HD projectors, which are shooting just from behind. They are like super powerfully uh, synchronized all together and as well uh, calibrated with the colors and as well pixel to pixel. Uh, we have as well the 3D audio, so you can not only experience the 3D vision but as well 3D audio as you go, and uh, we, you can go inside the data. <coughs> So I'll show you examples of that in a second. We have hemispherical dome, which is like uh, one of the largest hemispherical domes, which is traveling. So we can actually dismantle it and move to different places. And it's traveling across Australia and the world, <laughs> different art exhibitions. We have Mixed Reality Lab, which has a bunch of different traditional VR devices. And we have AVS Serum, which is 160 degrees cylindrical screen. And we have as well cluster systems, so like CPU cluster and GPU cluster, just everything in one building. So especially this is very important when you work with, for instance, medicine, when we have lots of uh, data which is either confidential or people asking you for confi confidentiality, then we basically can cut the network, uh, IP center from the network and uh, it's completely safe uh, to operate on the data sets. So a few words about technology. Uh, so IP cylinder, as I said, 56 display cubes. We have in infrared tracking cameras, so you can actually be tracked inside the system. So you can walk inside and you are inside the data. So perhaps you guys know that very, very well. I don't need, that. I don't need to explain perhaps how it works. And 32 channel audio system. We have also like this cluster dimension. So we have 28 nodes that drive the visualizations. They are synchronized 120 frames per second. We use NVIDIA. Quadro GPUs for doing that, and one Quadro drives two screens at once. So we have 56 screens, 28 PCs, just connected together, and that gives us, you know, the whole uh, system as it is uh, in the epicenter. This is how it looks. 
so basically, like uh, all these all these video cubes, you can open them up and you can see sets of projectors, and there are sets of mirrors as well. Everything is calibrated very very accurately. It takes one week to calibrate properly the whole system. So it's 56 screens, making sure the colors are matching with each other, and whether the pixels are not. Uh, going outside of the frames and stuff like that. We have almost no bezel as well. So the bezel is uh, 0.5 millimeter <coughs> because you have like a bit of skewness between the screens. And this is how it looks when you are inside the EP, EP cylinder. And this is like our cluster. And I always show this picture because it's a picture of cake next to the GPUs. So don't tell anyone that's how you can use GPUs. So like what we have in epicenter web traditions when you have a birthday, you bring the cake to the birthday. And of course, like because we are very busy, sometimes you bring the frozen cake, right? And in order to make it ready before the coffee, coffee break, we can put it outside of GPUs, put heavy compute, and have it ready in two hours, okay? And you can <laughs> enjoy the cake. Don't tell anyone, because this is not the proper use of GPUs. <laughs> and I start now with a couple of different examples of different projects. So this particular one is in genomic space because we have very high resolution screens. We can put lots of pixels on the screens, right? So you can imagine how it can be used. And often the questions was asked, why guys do you need a, such a high resolution screen? How do you use it differently than traditional VR or traditional high resolution screens? And this is an example of how you can use it. So this is genomic space when we have uh, DNA expressions and different chromosome maps. You can visualize everything at once. And the people who are coming from medicine, they actually can uh, interact with the data in completely new ways. So you're seeing us here interacting with the whole system. So what you see in chromosome maps, DNA unfolding, and then we can select any point on the screen using traditional game controller, and you, we can trick the system as a microscope on data. So you can zoom forever, and you can analyze the data as you go. On the top of it, I wanted to say as well about uh, interaction, so we can use HoloLens inside the cave system, and it can be used to recognize the gestures and as well use voice commands and uh, gaze for interacting with the data. So that's how you can use the system as well in combinations with other devices, which is very, very powerful because you can imagine you, have, you can have two-dimensional data sets sitting on the screen, but you can as well have holograms coming out of the screens and then you can interact with them and, and uh, really analyze, analyze data in completely different ways. Tell you a bit more about the next project, which is looking at the cancer, cancer treatment. So we're looking for applying uh, different drugs to different cells. So you're looking under the microscope, you apply a drug, and you look how the cell is changing its shape. So what you're doing, you're extracting, extracting 56 dimensional space, so different statistical similarity measures. And once you have that, you can use dimensional reduction uh, to go from 56 dimensional space into three dimensional space and basically look, uh, go inside the data and look uh, for uh, outliers very, very quickly. So this method allows you very quickly to detect outliers. And this particular one is looking at the uh, basically, you know, like different uh, cells at the moment. So we have different clusters and those clusters represent uh, different uh, time frames taken under the microscope. And then basically when you do uh, multidimensional reductions, if you look one particular cell, we do again saying, you know, like uh, segmentation and then calculating those 56 parameters, reducing that to, to 3D. And then uh, we uh, visualize stuff in three dimensional space. You can see some disconnections in between uh, multidimensional reductions. Very quickly you can detect outliers. So whether it's maybe cure for the cancer or possibly like error in the algorithms that we detected as well beforehand using this method. And we have like traditional visualization methods so you can do brushing, you can do uh, parallel coordinates, plotting and so on. So that, that works as well very, very efficiently. And having like multiple screens at the same time, you can use the system for actually visualizing different parameters at once and making decisions very quickly. So you can bring your whole team and analyze the data almost in no time, right? So that's how you can use this kind of systems. And of course, collaborative visual analytics. So this is something which is very, very unique uh, in terms of like a cave or benefits of caves. When you're coming inside and you're seeing each other and you can discuss um, about the data straight away uh, rather than simulating other people with avatars and so on. Uh, so this is very, very 
useful, especially if some of the projects we're preparing for, for instance, like using uh, virtual reality and cave systems for treating PTSD when you have psychologists, psychiatrists in the same space, uh, in the same location, and, and, and you can actually do that very, very well. We'll be talking as well lots about uh, massive networks. So this is one of our projects we did with, with the Data61. So that project was uh, basically done for cybersecurity reasons. So the government wanted to very quickly analyze the data sets, especially like cybersecurity and border protection, for instance, uh, make decisions very quick, quickly about, about, about the people who are coming to Australia, for instance. And basically, we were tasked to develop a project that allows us to visualize massive networks like one, one, up to one billion nodes in real time and make decisions almost straight away. Okay, so it was very, very fast. So what we did, we prepared like the proof of concept, which is, which is working on a traditional, traditional database system. The preparations of the, of the graphs are done using GL, uh, GLTF. So for those who are using lots of uh, low level uh, objects and uh, they know about the GLTF as well because GLTF allows you to construct the networks in a way that you can directly put them into GPU memory and very fast attach compute shaders to it and very quickly visualize that, and interact with that. And I'm going to show you an example, you know, how it looks in real time. Uh, so here we have uh, interactions with the whole system. So this particular one uh, network is uh, it's a network of social, social it's a something called TIAP that you know. It's a, it's a, reviewing, process, a reviewing portal w which has businesses and users. And basically we construct the network out of the data. So this is just a dummy data, data set because we couldn't show the data set which is coming from the government, of course. So basically we have like users depicted by the, uh, by the blue and businesses by the red. When the user reviewed the business, then you draw the line between them. And then you use force method for constructing the network. And you have almost no limitations, depending how much memory you have and compute in your GPUs, uh, then you can make fully interactive one. And what I like about this particular project is it's a participatory vis where you coming into data, you start somewhere, and you go from one point to another to discover different patterns. So for instance, in the Yelp, what we discovered was that most of the reviews are happening at the airports when people are sitting and being bored, they review different businesses. So this was one of the uh, conclusions that we drawn from this particular project. Uh, then the next project is something called creative mathematics. Uh, so this is for those who know, how many of you know about Shader Toy? Perhaps lots of people, right? So this is the highest resolution uh, fragment shader in the world. So basically how it works, you apply the uh, ray matching technique uh, to visualize everything, every single point. You're not using traditional triangles as you would do in traditional computer graphics. And basically visualize that uh, by drawing you know, artificial or abstract functions, mathematical functions behind the screens, finding cross sections with every point in 3D space. So you can simulate the ocean uh, like this, and it takes you know, like a couple of lines of code to develop stuff like that. And then you can go as well inside the fractals. So this is actually not reflecting uh, how you would feel inside the epicenter. So some of you were before in the epicenter, so recognize, you know, like it's completely different experience when you are actually there and being part of these fractals when you can fly through and, and experience, you know, really this wonderful feeling of uh, mathematical world of creativity. And I wanted to touch a bit about industry as well 4.0 because like I think that's where VR is going at the moment and uh, everybody is talking about uh, especially industry 4.0 and digital twins. Uh, not sure whether any of you are working in that space but I believe all of us are working in some ways because it's, it's where VR is actually shining uh, to push the envelope and especially there's lots of investments from especially New South Wales government is investing into that as well which is, which is fantastic because having networks across universities, we can actually push the envelope and, and, and uh, move the science forward. Yeah, so Industry 4.0 is about cyber physical systems and about connecting uh, Internet of Things and networks and making intelligent systems that making this world a better place. So I show you some of the examples in Digital Twins uh, that were done a long time ago. Digital Twins is actually a new term, so it's not very old. 
uh, it's getting a, a, a buzzy uh, this year. So like uh, Gartner is actually saying, it's actually on the growing curve. And what is digital twins? So digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical object or system, and it depends who defines that. So NASA, for instance, is saying a digital twin is, a, is an integrated multi-physics, multi-scale probabilistic simulations of an end-built vehicle or system that uses the best achievable physical models, sensor updates, fleet history, and so on and so on. And then we have Aswell GE saying about digital twin refers to digital, digital replicas of the physical assets and processes and so on. So you can see where is it going. So it's actually like in the past, everybody was talking about cloud computing and big data, now era of artificial intelligence. But I think digital twins connects them all together. So it's one big solution. And I think it's extremely, extremely important to actually put it on the arena here, just to have a bit of discussions, perhaps, what you guys think about where digital twins are going as well. And we have, we have different types of digital twins, and I will show you some of the examples what my team developed and what we developed in the past. So status twin, which is like looking more like monitoring different uh, equipment, so it can be like power plant, for instance. Operational twin that allows you to uh, use uh, <coughs> sensors to make better decisions. Uh, and then simulations twin connecting as well like those decisions uh, and simulation with simulations that can be represented in virtual environments. So I'll show you some of the examples of those. And lots of digital twins are starting to happen in the city. So that's why I'm showing this map. So this is like the cesium map, uh, which is running on our system. It's not properly synchronized because it sucks the data from the internet. So you can see some disparities between them. But that's what cities are understanding as the digital twins, replica of the, of the, of the cities that you can actually simulate the processes and see, see it from the bird's view when you're making optimizations on the traffic, on the, on the energy, on anything you can imagine to make the city a better place to live as well. And some of the examples of visualization we developed, so this particular one is looking at the photogrammetric reconstructions of the perf. Uh, so how it happened was plane flying above the city, capturing the images, Every single voxel on the space uh, on, on, on this particular visualization is 20 centimeters. And basically, we reconstruct uh, the visualization in real time using voxel maps. Uh, so we can, uh, using like this, uh, particularly this laptop, it works very, very fast. It has RTX 2080. Uh, so we can interact and fly over. So it's not only visualizations on the uh, real environment, but as well, we overlay the data such as uh, infrared, so you're gonna see in a second uh, as well like infrared temperatures. And based on infrared and temperatures, you can as well calculate, uh, just wanted to jump to that because it's a long animation, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. You can calculate as well vegetation map. So basically, this kind of digital twin of the real environment can help you to assess the situations, and especially like today we have Oh, in the last couple of days, Thomas mentioned as well, like lots of fires and stuff. So we could actually use this kind of visualizations and methods and digital twin uh, of the city scenarios to actually make better decisions, connecting that with simulations. It's a very powerful tool for uh, helping actually making us safe. So I wanted to talk about one project that's done by uh, one of my students as well, which is called Holo City. So he is working basically on connecting different data sets coming from different sources uh, in, the, in Sydney city itself and putting them on the, map in, in, on the map in augmented reality. So if you're interested to see that one, I think we'll have some demos at SIGGRAPH Asia. Uh, I can introduce you to him. He can show you basically how it works. So you can see the visualization of that. So this is like uh, city of Sydney. And what we're doing, we have huge amount of data coming from lots of sensors across the city. So whether it's like traffic data, it can be social networks, it, it can be culture network, it can be really like bike roads, congestions on the roads and so on. So basically like you can imagine, you know, visualizing the Sydney map above the table and have fully collaborative platforms when we have decision makers coming to the table and using augmented reality for uh, making decisions about the city or optimizing the traffic. Uh, even even working with AI on the top of it to make sure you know like the processes are 
not only one way but both ways when you're actually operating the sensors from from the remote location for instance so you can have like some uh, some data visualize so this particular one just wanted to sh stop somewhere here it's showing some peaks and those are peaks are representing congestion on the roads so you can actually look in real time how the uh, road would look like and what you need to do to actually uncongest uh, the, uh, the traffic. So it's very pleased when I was coming here because I was coming from the CVD, I was seeing there's like new tunnel, which is fantastic. Uh, and I like loved it actually to see it in real time in, in AR as well. So it helps me to get from city to here much, much faster. And using this kind of methods, you can actually optimize the processes and work with the cities to making city like more smart in a way. Another digital twin example is something called ASCAP. So this is project we've done with CSIRO, which is looking at this uh, Australian square kilometer array pine finder. So you can imagine sets of antennas looking in the sky and capturing hyperspectra. And those hyperspectra give you, you know, like the data cubes. And you can analyze and look for, for instance, black holes or UFOs, if you wish. And the whole idea of this project was to create a digital twin of Australian bush, but as well as sets of antennas, because it's a place uh, which you cannot access. So they were looking for the uh, ways how they can interact and operate the whole equipment remotely. Uh, so we developed like simulations of the landscape or with the simulations of the star constellations and so on, because like we can set up the time, like I said, 50 years from now, uh, on Monday morning, <laughs> what, what will be the locations of stars, for instance, right? So we can, we can do this kind of things. And as well, uh, the whole idea is you can select the antenna and you having the dashboard, which is showing the different readings from uh, that particular time. And you can make decisions and tele teleoperate it as you go as well. So that's one of the example of digital twin we developed uh, lately. And it's going to the next stage when we want to have situated analytics, when you go with AR goggles, and you point to different antennas and you can automatically, you know, see the dashboards with the data coming through and to make decisions. Another one is immersive prototyping, which is looking at the uh, metro station in particular. So we're working, we're working with, with the city, you know, some companies from the city as well, who are constructing the metro stations. And this is very, very powerful tool. When you are inside the cave, you have representations one to one and you're trying to set up uh, the engineering of the of the site in a way so you're coming inside the data it's coming as a cut drawings you visualize them you do simulations like agent based models which showing like different types of people coming out of train and you can simulate the feeling how would you feel being on such a crowded train station so this is one of the examples how you can use a uh, cave system for actually uh, prototyping uh, the metro stations we do lots of stuff with voxels as well. So this one is showing like the voxel space. This is UNSW Red Center. So we collaborate with Faculty of Built Environments and we're building digital twin of UNSW campus. So we're scanning that stuff and then we visualize it and flying through. Uh, on the top of it, we don't have simulations attached to it yet, but we're working on it. We did like locations, very accurate geolocations inside the building. So that's the project which is ending up this year. There'll be publications coming out of that. But it's super powerful what you can do with the voxels. So it's like Minecraft, right? Uh, but you can do it in real time and present it to the cities as a digital twin and attach simulations to it. And you have powerful analytical tool for making the place a better place. Another example is something uh, called, uh, it's a status twin and it's water treatment plant. So we're collaborating with, with CTEC from China and UNSW. Uh, so we're building, imagine, you know, having like a, a water treatment plant that you're gonna send to like remote locations and, and you want to teleoperate it. So basically this allows us, it's actually like a physical plant, which is very, very small. It fits in the track. And uh, what we're asked, we we're asked to provide like one-to-one -one representation. So it's super simple. It's like engineering, so it's like not super like photorealistic. But the purpose of this was actually to control the whole equipment from remote locations. So you can put VR goggles and go to India, go to China, and change the parameters and make sure you know like people always have clean water. So this is a very very powerful way of doing uh, connecting virtual reality with the power plants, for instance, and making sure you know you have 
this kind of teleoperation is enabled everywhere. You don't need to work and go there. You just use the VR goggles, stay at home, and operate the super, super, super heavy equipment, which is super powerful in my opinion. We do have asphalt hemispherical dome, so this is an example of the uh, dome that we have in, in epicenter. So if you, if you come and visit, you can see it's six, six and a half meters in diameter. You just lie underneath and we visualize different animations to explain complex sciences to more general audiences. So it's very, very powerful in terms of uh, communications and visual visualizations that we can uh, actually explain various like complexities in mathematical processing, so AI or, or, or just a traditional art. Okay, I'm I, I, I spoke a bit about different, different types of projects, different systems. And basically what we're doing now, before SIGGRAPH, we're releasing our framework, which is called Multimodal High-End Visualization System HEX. So you're gonna see that one perhaps in two days. We just almost, we just almost have it online. Uh, so basically, uh, the whole idea is, if you, if you see the center like epicenter, uh, it's super powerful, it, it's the highest resolution virtual reality cave system in the world, but it's the only one. So we started doing stuff like in unflexible ways, where you have to develop stuff for the system. I wanted to actually scale it, up, scale, scale it up. So if I want to come to a conference and bring my VR goggles and show the projects we do, we couldn't do it initially. So we started developing projects that allows us to run across different platforms, hardware platforms, uh, has multi-user interconnected platforms and uses different interaction methods uh, and allows you to have one executable that will run across a variety of, of, of systems. So we ran the same executable across five different labs in Epicenter. We tested the same framework at EPFL in the lab uh, led by Professor Sarah Kendendine. We collaborated with Professor Gus Thomas, Mark Billinghurst as well. Some of the students are using the frameworks and we're growing the network at the moment. So the whole idea is, you know, you do VR. You plug our asset, it replaces your camera, you compile executable, you bring USB stick to Epicenter, you plug it in, three seconds we run the stuff on very high resolution system, cluster based using 28 systems. You want to run it on, on, on VR, it runs on VR. If you run, want to run it on hemispherical dome, it will run on hemispherical dome. So if you're interested, just let me know perhaps after, after this conference and I can send you links when we have it uh, online, okay? And you can use it in your labs. So this is gonna be fully open for everybody and, and I hope it will change the way we collaborate uh, in between those big labs and VR and AR as well towards the future. And how much time I have more, Thomas? Uh, yeah, some, uh, no, it's about half an hour almost. Okay, so I can slow down, so I'm just rushing. So, uh, so i show you like perhaps two more examples uh, how you can use uh, digital twins and, and some of the like more use cases that we use VR for good. So this particular one is a ship loader, which was a project we developed in CSIRO. It's more than 10 years ago now. Uh, it's basically was like, you have the mining site in Australia, Western Australia, when you have a, uh, big ship, ship coming to the to the port, and then we put the uh, like iron ore to the hatches, and it goes back, and so on. There's lots of accidents because it's 45 degrees heat. So what we propose, we propose teleoperation scenarios when we actually move the whole operations from the area where the ships are coming to the remote locations, or to the control room. So it's like from, from this location to this location. And for that, we use like a uh, lady back camera. Perhaps some of you know that very well. It's not the newest solution. Uh, we, we did lots of great uh, research how we can actually hack the camera to do very fast uh, video streaming uh, and like mining, mining scenarios. So basically how it was done when you have like six different six different cameras on the lady back, you use like OpenGL mesh, 3D rendered mesh, and you render uh, image from each of the camera and stream it live, and then you plug it to the hemispherical dome, and you can sit in the front of it, like feeling you are in the front of, of the mining equipment. So this is how it looks uh, when you have like, this is like the control room, when you have like hemispherical dome, operator sitting in the front, having a bunch of joysticks and monitors controlling the whole system, and that's how you can teleoperate the whole mining equipment. Uh, what we did as well, we, uh, 
included lots of sensors, so we have like uh, infrared cameras, but as well like laser scanners, so constantly scanning the ships as it was coming to the port. So you could get as well like the point clouds of the tonnage of the hatches. So you don't need to actually have a person walking on the deck and saying that's, that's full, just move to the next one. You can automatically update the icons on the, on the user interface and automatically move the system to the next one. This is how it looks in the front of hemispherical dome. So we did it in a very, very simple way when we had projectors sitting behind the screen, uh, shooting into spherical mirror and reflecting to the screen so you don't have shadow casting when the person is in the front of the screen and can fully interact using hand gestures with the whole system as well. And this is the, the diagram. So we use different sensors to actually create digital twin of the real mining equipment. So we use like seek la laser scanner, which is constantly scanning the, the environment. And, and as well, INS sensors uh, giving you accelerations, integrating accelerations, you can get the location. And basically having that, attaching that to the mining equipment, you could actually reconstruct in virtual environments uh, the whole locations of different mining uh, equipments. Okay, so I have another example again. So like lots of examples, as I said. Uh, this is about Great Barrier Reef. So you're in Australia. I don't know for how many of you are staying here a bit longer, and we'll have opportunity to go to Queensland and explore the Great Barrier Reef. So that was the projects that we've done three, four years ago with the ASAMS, which is ARC Center of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, and especially team, a team at QUT. When we are looking for mapping the coral bleaching, for instance, and you could do it using citizen science and VR. And basically how we did it, we created a portal uh, that allows you to capture the data from, for instance, tourists or, or reef scientists. So once you log to the portal, uh, it's like the whole prototype system that has many components. Uh, so it has spatial modeling, web interface, and virtual reality experiences. And I will show you animation in a second how it works. But the whole idea was if you go to the uh, Great Barrier Reef, you can dive, you can get 360 degrees video or photograph, upload it to the portal, and then basically show it to the expert in the reef. And, and they have to mark a couple of points on the photographs. That's submitted to the geostatistical uh, a service that allows you to reconstruct uh, the current situation as well as you go. So this is an example of that. So once you uploaded the photo, you will see the QR code on the photo which is in the portal. Then use VR to detect the QR code. Then you go inside the VR. You have 20 different points in the VR in 360 that you can actually mark. So you can say what you're seeing, whether you're seeing coral, bleach coral, whether you're seeing sand, or whether you're seeing fish or some other things. Based on that, you can use the power of citizen science if you have thousands of people going to Great Barrier Reef and reconstruct how the Great Barrier Reef will look like in time, right? Whether the color bridging is actual, actually the problem and whether we can do something about that to help. So this is an example how you can use VR in this kind of context. And I have one last example how you can use VR as well to save Jaguars. So I'm not sure whether some of you are from Peru, but we sent a bunch of people to Peru, to Peruvian jungle. In Peru, there's like this problem where Peruvian government is selling vast of lands to mining industry, uh, and of course, uh, it worries us because you know the nature can be destroyed. So basically, what we did, we sent a couple of uh, girls to the forest, and they were traveling across the uh, the bush, really, and and capturing 360 movies and photographs, and having those, so you can see. Uh, here the camera we use, so it's like GoPro camera with, with, uh, with GoPro rig and Rykoch Tita, so the first version so it was actually not very stable in the uh, tropical environments because lots of problems with electronics, humidity and so on, so you can imagine. But anyway, it was a very successful project and the uh, whole team was traveling throughout the jungle, so there was no electricity or no internet at all, so once we knew they are in the jungle, reaching the jungle, we only had information from them after four weeks. So it was like really, really like very, very, very strange experience for us. But anyway, they were traveling from one village to another, stealing a bit of electricity from the local, uh, local tribes. So you can see power generator trying to recharge all the computers and, and, and all the cameras they were having. And what they did, they did exactly something similar to what we did with the Great Barrier Reef, where they were able to uh, 
get 360 photographs and do annotations on the photographs from the experts in uh, Jaguar population. So we don't need to send Jaguar populations anywhere to Django, but we bring Django to the experts, right? And using VR, you can actually uh, predict how the Jaguars are moving into the jungle. So publications, so if you're interested in this topic, I won't be talking much about this now. Uh, just have a look at our publications, which is showing you how using VR and citizen science can give you the uh, predictions how the Jaguars move in the jungle, and we have different models, geostatistical models that are applied. And in my opinion, this project is perfect exa example how you can connect virtual reality with computational stats, computational mathematics, for making this world a better place. Okay, so uh, this is basically my message about this particular project. And I have like the last one really, this is last example before I wrap up. Uh, so this is as well a bit of kind of like digital twin, but showing uh, a gamified example of VR and natural disaster land. So that was done with collaborations between students, artists, and scientists in a way, I would say, where you're trying to communicate or educate kids about the uh, importance of different sensors. And the whole idea was to construct linear storytelling where people can play and experience different things and they learn by doing that. And the whole idea was about natural disaster, so sort of like disa disasters coming to the land and you have to react in a certain way. So very, very linear, but it was very, very popular. Uh, it was done, uh, I think, two, year, two or three years ago uh, and it's very, very cool. So basically what you have, you have like the big wave coming to the land, so everything is like done. You have to save the people. Really, so what you have, you have like a big land, you have people living in, uh, in homes, and then there's like a warning from the system saying, you know, you have to save the people, right? Move them uh, away from what the wave is coming in. So that's what you need now. And the next stage, what you need to do, you need to, uh, there'll be warning about the fire, and the fire will be in the forest. So what you need to do, so you need to prevent that. So you need to push the button to send the helicopters with the water to remove the fire from the, from the trees. And then after you do that, you can move people to, to homes back. It's not the perfect animations because it was, I think, me bumping around the table when I was trying to record that. I have to re-record that again. So you go like, through a bunch of different you know, tasks that you know, kids can play and learn from doing. And it's actually a very powerful way of teaching young, younger generations about importance of different scientific uh, applications of sensors, IoT, and so on. So you can do that if you, uh, if you think it's, it's, it's important and valuable as well. Yeah, and uh, one more thing I wanted to say about SIGGRAPH Asia as well. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how many, how many of you are coming actually to SIGGRAPH Asia? So I feel like a couple of people coming in, so it would be fantastic to see you guys there. <coughs> and and uh, SIGGRAPH Asia has a couple of different surprises for you this year. So we're expecting 14,001 people. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy the experience as well in Brisbane. I'll be perhaps talking much about that. Uh, you should enjoy the VRST. Sydney is a great city as well, so make sure you explore the Sydney city as well, everywhere you can, as much time as you have. Uh, and Sean wanted to show like the snapshots from Brisbane. Uh, kangaroos, you can see them in Sydney as well, right? Just in the backyard. And this is like a small promo from, uh, from Brisbane. But let me just go to the questions. Uh, if you have any questions and uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, happy to answer any questions. And as well, I wanted to say, the stuff I was showing, I hope it wasn't very boring. There's like lots of examples. Uh, if, there is, uh, if, you, if, there, if you have a bit of time to come and visit the epicenter, just let me know so we can organize that. There's as well Huyen, so Huyen can raise the hand. You can ask Huyen and we can organize the tour for you. Uh, my whole team from epicenter is going to SIGGRAPH Asia to Brisbane on Saturday. So if you want to come and visit, perhaps the best day will be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Okay? So just let us know if you want to see some of these projects I was showing live. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, guys? I have a question. Uh, 
with the with the asset that you mentioned, this H E D H E V S. Yes. H -E -V -S yeah. When when do you, when is the release date for this, and okay. how do you envision the collaboration with other centers doing things? So, okay, so so just put it here. So that's very very good questions. Thank you. So the release will be on Friday. Okay. So uh, it's gonna it's gonna be because like we have demo at uh, VRKI, and after the demo we post everything online. We have a couple of presentations during SIGGRAPH Asia as well about this particular tools. And in terms of collaborations, I think the whole idea of trying to build it for the community. So one very first thing uh, that you can notice if you run a uh, cave system, for instance, you need to have commercial software running the, the cave system. Usually, that's how it works. And the commercial system costs, I won't be saying any names of the companies and so on, costs around like $40,000 to $60,000 per year per license. I want to actually change that because the companies are Providing those frameworks are super, super expensive, but as well uh, not very flexible. They are very slow in uh, having like very special requests. Uh, we hit the wall with providing some very simple features that I was saying it's ridiculous because we could do it in one day if you have access to the APIs, we have no access to the APIs. So the whole idea of this particular project is to get community working together. And, and as soon as you have it, you'll be able to develop it using them and deploying in your labs. And, and uh, we are developing currently as well something called, that's the collaboration is coming, plugging in, something called like, I would say maybe like App Store, where Thomas is developing his project here, and basically, you know, like he uploads his uh, executables uh, to App Store, and click Thomas, Thomas in Epicenter can actually drag it and put it in Epicenter and show it to other people. Uh, it will okay. be just, you know, uh, on the go. Uh, the whole idea is as well, perhaps next year, we'll be trying to build as well like international grants connecting uh, visualization centers. So we're talking, we're already talking with universities across Australia to be part of this of this endeavor and application process. And we'll be looking for international collaborators as well. So the idea is, you know, to build something together and, you know, uh, run maybe exhibitions, maybe, you know, like digital twins, you know, at the same time across the globe. Uh, so you can tell me. If you have some ideas, we're very happy to listen. Uh, and I hope it's going to be used everywhere. So, Thank you very much. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Here. <coughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, you, you have fantastic immersive facilities in your, in yeah. your lab. I think that maybe something is lacking. You don't have any system with floor projection. Yeah. So you have VRL mats if you want to, to collect yeah. fully mass, but what do you think about that? Do you need to uh, one more <laughs> the cave in yes. your, yes. In okay. your okay. lab? Okay. Yeah, I, I got what you're getting. So usually if you want to have like uh, full immersive environments, we use like VR, right? So we use VR traditionally in our labs. You were right, our cave or our epicylinder, it has no projections on the floor. We're thinking about that, putting some extra projectors to expand the perception and expand, you know, like the space. Uh, the one where we actually, uh, the projects I was showing of genomics, for instance, uses HoloLens, and HoloLens can give you this, you know, like filling up the gap uh, and the mixed reality space when you have, you know, flat screen versus uh, holograms on the top of it, possibly having VR and other, another, another system at the same time. So that's how we're filling the gap. Uh, I really want to say I want to have floor because I really believe there is a big value in having floor. So I used to work at NIST for like a couple of months uh, in the US when they have like three walls cave. And it was great experience being inside the cave and having, you know, seeing actual stuff behind your leg or be, be above your legs uh, when you can interact with that. Absolutely, there is huge value in that. But I think at the moment we'll be just using hol hol holographic projections or the, ho the uh, ho HoloLens and, and the mix of AR for filling the gap. In the future, I want to do the grants uh, to maybe upgrade the cave. So currently, as I mentioned, Epicenter is the highest resolution VR system in the world, the cylindrical screen, uh, and it has 56 HD projectors. My next goal is actually to upgrade it to 8K each screen. So maybe in two, three years, we want to have hyper resolution and, and perhaps like we have to upgrade perhaps everything because if we're talking about 8K, you need to have better GPUs as well. Because those GPUs we have, they are not fast enough, unfortunately. So there's lots of, lots of space for improvements. Yeah. 
experience in the early 2000s yeah. in a hyper uh, for the time excellent facilities in Denmark for example yeah. in uh, uh, in Orbu University um, they reported that industry doesn't pick up on that and is not impressed what is your now sort of uh, okay so experience yeah that's a very, that's a very very good question so that's always that's always uh, a question mark whether you can actually inspire industry to use this kind of systems so what we're seeing you know uh, I'm, that's why we, that's one of the reasons we develop HEFs right because we're saying you don't want especially we started collaborating with School of Medicine and we didn't they didn't want to come to the lab basically to play with the high resolution screens because they have lab like five kilometers away right so basically having HEFs that allows us to deploy stuff in VR now, in terms of industry, so uh, in the era of digital twinning, we're seeing actually lots of movements. I have lots of requests from the industry around digital twins now. So, you know, how you can uh, visualize and make cities better, how you can actually do operations in the power plant, stereo operation. Uh, immersive prototyping is a huge area as well. So, how you can actually be inside the space, but in fully collaborative space, which is actually something. Uh, that I think VR is not giving you, but the cave will give you when you see other people together in the same space. Uh, and uh, we have collaborators who are from DSTG Defense as well, so there's uh, lots of interest in explainable AI and using uh, multi-agent simulations, but for making very quick decisions. So it's like, you know, war game scenarios. When you have Napoleon was planning the wars, was having like a props on the map uh, and whiskey, we don't use whiskey, we use supercomputers, so you can do 40,000 simulations at the same time and you can get, get the best probabilistic distribution and make best decisions. So, yeah, Queen can tell you a bit more about that as well. She was at the beginning of this project, we're evolving into as well like uh, reinforcement learning for the systems. There's lots of interest from industry, but it's not always, it not always works, of course. So it's like, you know, I would say 50-50. When people are coming in, uh, they would, would like to, sis, to, to use the system in a collaborative way. Uh, and some people, they just want to go to their own labs and develop stuff on the, on the screens and, and VRs. That's what HEFS provides you. Uh, that, that's why we're pushing into developing that, yeah. Okay. Very impressive system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a question around working with sensitive data for companies who do want to use your system do you require them to bring their own hard drives or do you low-level format things after just to make sure that no data sticks around yeah so so that depends on the use cases of course so you know like uh, as I said the whole epicenter has own uh, compute so it have GPU cluster and CPU cluster we can disconnect the epicenter completely from the external network. That makes people more confident we can, we can secure the data. In terms of data sets, we had scenarios where people are uploading data to the clouds and they trust clouds. And one of the most trusted clouds is like uh, Microsoft you know, OneDrive. And it's basically like certified by the university it's a safe cloud. So as long as you are confused with that, uh, then we can use OneDrive. For doing for doing data exchange and so on, but we have people coming with the hard drives for the same reason as well because they said I don't trust anything outside. I want to bring you a physical hard drive, and the example of that was the perf map I was showing you. So it's like data was kind of confidential initially, and and they didn't want it to to be spread anywhere, so they brought it on hard drives. Okay. Uh -huh. So this is. In, indeed impressive, uh, but it does require a rather large uh, facility. Um, and I was wondering whether this is sort of like, uh, the long-term goal also is to, to have this large facility in the future, or whether you're really working on understanding how uh, using modern VR technologies you can democratize it, and, and basically in the future maybe you won't need the epicenter because you'll, you'll be able to spread this uh, to multiple places using consumer technology. Yeah, so, so that's why HEFS is happening, because we want to actually scale it up. That's one of our main goals. So all the projects you've seen, they run on the Epi cylinder. You'll be able to run them in VR as well. Only problem is you won't get this hyper resolution, right? So that's the only problem, but it's maybe not a problem, 
depending what what kind of visualizations you're looking for. Uh, and absolutely, you know, I'm hearing you that maybe you don't need this kind of sentence. I partially agree, partially disagree. When I was coming to the job, I was saying I don't know whether I like cave systems, but I think I like them more. We use cave system more than VR at the moment because it gives you like additional tools. Uh, for doing collaborative aspects, and especially you know, one of the projects we're looking at the moment, as well as uh, extending, you know, how you can actually treat anxiety or you know, like PTSD using VR system. So lots of people doing that, skip Rizzo and so on, you know, like uh, you know that in the VR world. Uh, but I believe, you know, in cave systems, you could do it much better when you have psychologists, psychiatrists, and the patients at the same time looking at each other. You don't need to simulate, you know, like the avatars and feeling in VR which is very, very natural. So I think that will change the aspects of how we can actually do stuff in the centers like that. But saying about scalability, you, if, if you have like people, lots of elderly people, they don't want to come to the systems to get, for instance, treated, then you can send VR device and have exactly the same kind of experience, right? So there's like many different aspects and moving elements. Uh, and, and I think we need centers like that. So not only for PR, because that's one of the aspects why we have that. So trying to promote what we do in Australia, especially because like my goal is actually to promote computer graphics in Australia. That's why we're bringing Sigraph Asia. That's why I'm super happy to have all these conferences happening. It's a powerhouse of computer graphics for the next two weeks, I guess. We have lots of conferences happening. Uh, but we need to keep momentum building, and that's the way having centers like that that help us to actually touch the community, really. That's what I feel as well. If you don't know, we have lots of people not knowing about it. They come to Epicenter, they change their mind. It's good. So, but you know, it's not for everybody as well. Yeah. So I don't know whether that answers your question. We can talk about this over and over. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So um, in continuation <coughs> of the PTSD treatment and stuff, uh, presence and immersion is a big part of virtual reality. What's your take on? presence and immersion in cave systems compared to virtual reality. Yeah, so we are we are we are integrating, we're trying to integrate all the systems. So it was like IoT and you know like a bunch of different sensors measuring biofeedback. So we're looking at uh, we constructed some proof of concept. We're going we're trying to get some bigger grants at the moment in that space so we can actually move on and connect with connecting with hospitals. So actually next year we're gonna have a project with the hospitals looking at anxiety. But we're talking about attaching sensors and measuring, you know, what people are feeling. And what I want to actually do personally as well, look at uh, the aspects of, of bodies, how we react about different, for instance, graphics primitives, you know, whether they give you some stories and, you know, whether we can actually connect them together. So we develop, you know, like a sensor networks when you have like IoT, so we have like, you know, like uh, heart rate, you know, like EEG, and all the sensors you can imagine measure different bio biofeedbacks and trying to correlate that and go forward with that. So that will be part of the PTSD as well. So it's step by step. Sorry, I just, go ahead. I want to have a quick follow on that. Uh, you said that you're using EEG and ECG on uh, on the cave system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't get any error of the EEG signal when you install it on the cave? That's like wireless. So we are in the process of testing that at the moment. And I can tell you in like perhaps two, three months, because we have students coming and working and experimenting. Because we're doing something similar, but we're using yeah. a Faraday cage. OK. Because ECG works, but EEG, I'm okay. not sure. Thank you. Thanks. OK, okay we have time for one more question. Well, great presentation. Could you put up, first of all, a request? Could you put your contact information slide back up here? I think your first one. And also, uh, where do you see the, uh, for Industry 4.0 applications, where would you see the, uh, the most likely applications, let's say over the next five to 10 years? And also, do you have secure facilities playing off what was asked earlier? Let's say running cyber conflict simulations in a cave environment. Let, let's, just, let's just hypothetically say it's NATO. Would you be able to do something like that that could be secure? Yeah, can you, can you actually repeat the first part? Because I was just focusing on changing the... Oh, uh, just where you see things, uh, opportunities in Industry 4.0 over the next five to ten years. Where would you see the, the lowest hanging fruit? 
Yeah, so I think, I think uh, coming to the community like this, right, talking about digital twins. So having like VRST guys, you guys are doing like, you're on the forefront of VR and development. And I think optimizing the processes and using digital twinning is actually the way to go forward and connecting like VR with uh, simulations and artificial intelligence. I think it's an opportunity for all of us because lots of people are doing AI, lots of people are doing simulations, but sometimes we are not connected together. So I think the good examples like work that Thomas is doing as well. Uh, and I think that's where, that's, that's where the opportunity lies, how we can actually use digital twinning for improving the processes, making this world a better place, more optimized, uh, making better cities, uh, teleoperating, different scenarios, simulating, a large scale, I want to simulate the whole cities, for instance, you know, if possible in the future, maybe whole Australia in simulation, why not? And just to have different scenarios modeling, so, so those are the opportunities in my opinion. Yeah, so that's something, that's something perhaps I can point you perhaps to more uh, Data61 research. I can send you, if you send me an email, I sent you a couple of reports about the, the cyber and security when it's coming and linking with uh, digital twins. Uh, security and ethics as well. So there's like a framework used by Data61 about ethics lately uh, in this space and the future. And that's a very beautiful report. I, I don't need to repeat it, I'll just send you the link. Okay, it's a PDF. If someone is interested, just send me an email, please, and I will forward you that. It's online. All right, this is just a comment from me. So, we, you know, in general, we can see there is a bit of the hype is over for the VR at this moment, at least in the industry perspective. And we, as you know, scientists in VR, we can make it a really good experience and improve the experience, but we will depend on people like your team, you know, to find the killer app for our, for our technology that we, you know, love so much. And I think the visual analytics is it, right? It's, or cyber physical systems, the training yeah. and all yeah. those things. So that was absolutely fantastic presentation. I thank you very much, Tomas. Please put your hands together for Tomas.